So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stand, if that's okay with you. Um, my name again is Tessa Bogan. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of, of the Radboud, University of Nijmegen. I did a PhD at the University of Amsterdam on surrealism and esotericism. It's called The Occultation of Surrealism. It uh, came out 2012, available online. And I'm hoping, or I am making it into a book now, I'm hoping to publish it next year. And I'm now developing a new postdoc project, which I'm going to speak about today. Let me just take a little bit of time. It's about Jerome Bosch, who is uh, not an avant-gardist, but a medieval, medieval artist. But he is made sometimes into some sort of honorary avant-gardist by being made into a surrealist. This is one of his most famous paintings, The Garden of Earthly Delights. And these are two portraits of him, one self-portrait, one portrait by another. Jerome Bosch is called Geronimus, um, Jeroen, Jerome. There are different ways of saying his name. I'm going to stick to Jerome for now. And um, you may or may not be aware of it, but Jerome Bosch is a surrealist, or at least he is so judging by the internet, but also various online popular publications. He is called the father of surrealism, the first surrealist, even one I like most, the first true surrealist, as if there were untrue surrealists as well. He was surreal before surrealism, etc. And apparently he was so inspiring to Dali, but also Max Ernst and Marie, that he set the bar for them. And as is well known, he was claimed as a precursor, an official precursor by the Surrealists themselves. And the Surrealists constructed many genealogies of forefathers, occasionally foremothers, stretching backward in time. And Jerome Bosch is apparently one of the great ones. So in any case, it's sort of generally accepted, um, at least in popular publications, that Bosch's works are surreal, surrealist or even surrealistic, and that he was a surrealist avant la lettre. Today, I am exploring this issue, and in particular, I'd like to focus on this process of the canonization of Bosch as a surrealist avant la lettre. I'll be discussing a sort of a chronology of events, and as will become clear, it was in fact surrealist outsiders, like critics or curators, who first made him into a surrealist, and the surrealists themselves only followed. I'll also offer some reflections on the modernity of Bosch. I must say, I've just started on this, on this research, I'm still in the very first stages, it's a bit preliminary and um, I'm just going to go out on to a limb and make very bold claims, but if it, if it appears a bit preliminary, that's correct, because it is, so bear with me. Now, the association of Bosch with surrealism, it feels apparently so natural to many that it is stated that Bosch appeared already in the first manifesto of Breton. Um, in fact, the first mention of Bosch in an official surrealist communication is in Surrealism and Painting by Breton in 1928, which is an essay where Breton describes the surrealist style of art or of painting by means of Max Ernst. Max Ernst is the example. And I should point out that this, this is an important essay for many reasons, but also because it's a response to the fact that surrealism, even though it's sort of started out as a literary movement was very quickly turning into a painter's movement. And in 1925, Max Maurice had still said there is no such thing as surrealist painting, but reality was proving otherwise. And Breton was embracing painting into surrealism in this essay. He writes these very convoluted Breton sentences. And one of them, the purpose of surrealist painting as exemplified by Ernst, so Ernst is the example here, is to avoid all preconceived designs as far as possible, and with the same eye with which one from one's window watches a man with an open umbrella walking along a roof, with the same mental reaction that allows one to think that a windmill may serve as a perfectly convenient headdress for a woman, since Bosch has a woman wear one in his temptation, to assert by means of the image relationships other than those generally established between two things. This is the painting that he refers to, Temptation of Saint Anthony Abbott in the Prado, which is today considered a copy, actually, not by Bosch himself. And you see uh, Saint Anthony Abbott 
and there is a brothel, the building with the old woman's hat. There is not only a naked woman standing on the doorway, but it's also a flag with a swan. Uh, topped with an old woman's head and a destroyed Spanish mill. At the moment, I don't know where Proton would have seen this painting, how he would have known by it, but of course, uh, being involved with art as he was, he did see many reproductions of paintings as well. The very same year, a critic uh, responded to Proton's surrealism and painting, listing several surrealist painters like Ernst de Masson, Tanguy Miron, and drawing a line between them, these paintings, and the artists of extraordinary sensibility, such as Jerome Bosch and Breuvel the Elder. And uh, Bosch and Breuvel are mentioned in tandem here, and it's even stated that they, they Bosch and Breuvel, indulged in their madness only intermittently. The very next year, an important connection is made between Bosch and Dalí. At an exhibition of Dali paintings in Madrid, two critics write that Dali reminds them very much of Bosch, and many Bosch paintings were in the Spanish royal collections. Indeed, in fact, Bosch had sort of been forgot, almost forgotten all over Europe, except in, in Spain. So, to these critics, it's apparently quite a natural connection to make. And then, suddenly, in 1934, this association between Bosch and Dali is cemented by Herbert Reed who wrote a brief essay entitled Bosch and Dali, um, saying that Bosch went beyond realism in painting to the irrational. His fantasy was of exceptional nature, and even more by comparison, the fantasy of Salvador Dali is feeble, or shall we say, sparing. So these critics, therefore, rather than the surrealists, made the connection between Bosch and Breuvel, Breuvel the other, which we will see repeated again and again, a connection between Bosch and Dali, which is today taken for granted. Um, Bosch is made into a certain artist of sentiment. Related to that, Bosch is associated with madness, the irrational, and with fantasy. And the Bosch surrealism connection is made in continental sources, but also in English sources. Then we come to the pivotal year 1936, when everything is suddenly happening at the same time. Three international surrealist exhibitions were hosted that year. Uh, the Exposition Surrealiste de l'Objet in uh, Paris, which was organized by the surrealists themselves. The Great International Surrealist Exhibition at New Burlington Galleries in London in the summer. And finally, in December of that year, the Grand Fantastic Art Dada Surrealism in New York. And in particular, this last exhibition, which sort of traveled all around the country, was very influential in introducing U.S. audiences to surrealism. Now, the Paris exhibition was also accompanied by a special issue of Cahiers d'Art. It was much written about it, so I would say we, um, at this time in Europe and also in Britain and in the U.S., news about surrealism was reaching very large audiences, or at least larger audiences than before. And in one of the great coincidences of history, or perhaps we should say an instance of objective chance, 1936 was also the year of a great retrospective of Hieronymus Bosch in the museum uh, Boymans von Bernie in Rotterdam. It garnered quite some attention of the press, and this is almost the first retrospective on such a scale of Bosch in the 20th century. Indeed, um, Bosch had been forgotten quite quickly, already two generations after, he, after his death. And it's only in 1936 that he's put on the map again. Uh, in a response to the very important exhibition Les Primitifs Flamands in Bruges in 1902, which the title clearly echoes. So a pivotal year in, in Bosch studies, so to say. There was also a painting by him on display in Paris, and there were quite some scholarly publications coming out, which were reviewed, and several reviewers made um, the connection with um, surrealism. Um, so these are several of the studies that came out in that year, 1936, 1937, in French and in German. Some of them were quickly translated as well. Now, the great fantastic art data surrealism show in the MoMA, um, Alfred Barr, who I guess most of you are familiar with, mentions Bosch immediately in his catalogue stating, Bush transformed traditional fantasy into a personal and original vision which links his art with that of the modern surrealists. And in the actual show, Barr did the same thing. The very first room, which is called Fantastic Art of the Past, featured very prominently Bush 
as well as Giovanni Di Paolo, Duval, Walden, Durer, Walden Green, and several others. And the catalog also included images for a study of temptation, which is this one. And there were two other works from the School of Bosch in the exhibition as well. And I would in fact argue that it's Barr, Alfred Barr, who is responsible for positioning Bosch as the precursor. Let me emphasize that uh, none of these surrealists had in fact made this claim by this time officially. Indeed, the surrealists themselves had hardly remarked upon Bosch as of yet. Barr, by means of his, his traveling exhibition and the catalog, uh, made this connection very clearly. And I think we cannot underestimate, or can hardly underestimate, the influence of Barr's exhibition upon the American audience's idea of surrealism, also because it traveled. It caused controversy in every location, and it made surrealism quite prominent in the press. And Bosch as well, because he was the one starting the exhibition, and several press reviews, in fact, incorporated the direct link between Bosch and Surrealism. I would say, in fact, that this view of Barr as Bosch as the precursor influenced the Surrealists when they came to the US during the war. Interestingly enough, when the, when this, the French Surrealists came to the US, they sort of encountered an opinion of their own movement, which was quite different and less radical than their own Surrealism as they knew it back in Europe. And they had been creating these genealogies since the early days, but you can see that their new genealogies begin to reflect also the genealogies that were created by outsiders and critics and the audience. And they reflect also the fact that American audiences considered surrealism to be a painter's movement, not so much a literary movement and not at all a political movement. The journal view, the American journal view, which was patronized by the surrealists, published this sort of, it's like a word cloud avant la lettre, as it were, of Ernst, Max Ernst's inspiration, including Bosch and Grönewald and Bruegel as well. And then in 1942, André Breton wrote sort of a small booklet called On the Survival of Certain Myths and on Some Other Myths in Growth or Formation, which accompanied the first papers of Surrealism exhibition. Um, and the very first page, which is the myth of the Golden Age, we see a citation by Lotre um, a still from the film La Vido by Louis Dumoulin, and a reproduction of The Fountain of Life from The Garden of Earthly Delights by Bosch. So he is here clearly enfolded into surrealism by Breton. Now we, came to, now we come to the really pivotal moment, which is 1947, the grand exhibition of the Surrealists on return to Paris. Breton organized sort of a grotto, a preliminary show, which would feature the Surrealists despite themselves, including very prominently Bosch. And they were described as artistes, pre surrealistes so really painters. Interestingly, this part of the show was never realized, but Breton included his description of this part in the catalog. So for many who didn't visit the show, it was still part of it because they could read the whole plan and the whole outline. Um, and Breton may have had several reasons for including Bosch here so prominently. First, I think he sort of showed his sensitivity to the American discourse and also to, so to Barr, actually, the show by Barr, and also to Ernst. Um, in addition, I also think that Breton considered Bosch to have been quite subversive, which is another reason for him to include him here. And I will return to this point in a moment. Let me just quickly finish the chronology. 1954, uh, Fantastic Art in Belgium from Bosch to Magritte was the theme of the Biennale Pavilion of Belgium, showing that fantastic art is sort of now this meta category spanning ages. In 1957, Breton published his grand oeuvre about art and surrealism, magical art, and he really returned to Bosch with a vengeance in it, mentioning him at length in the introduction, mentioning again the temptation of Saint Anthony. And in the second part of the book, when he sort of showcases the grand vision of magical art, the journey of magical art through the ages, there's a chapter on the Middle Ages, and Bosch has his own paragraph entitled Jerome Bosch, Introversion and Psychoanalysis of Matter. And Breton states, Jerome Bosch is the integral visionary. It hasn't even been half a century since his work has come out of obscurity. 
and already it is challenging the very foundations of the art of painting. And he reproduced several paintings by Bosch, Curing the Stone of Madness, Triptych of the Hay One Wing, Another Temptation. Bosch has painted many temptations of St. Anthony. This is another one. Apparently by 1972 it was so canonified that it became the subject of an inquiry. Do you consider Jerome Bosch a precursor of surrealism? Many of the art historians said no. Psychoanalysts and surrealists said yes, and Eleven reserved judgment. And by 1973, Charles von Bernier could write that the surrealists were largely responsible for a renewal of interest in Bosch in this century. I would actually say that there was a renewal of Bosch in the 20th century, and the surrealists went along with it. They were more trend followers or trend goers than trend setters, but they were now considered the trend setters. And today, in public opinion, surrealism has apparently been around for ages. It is sort of this atemporal universalist movement surviving throughout the centuries, a centuries old tradition. And in particular, many of Bosch's paintings qualify as surrealistic with their fantastic images and incongruous juxtapositions. Bosch anticipated the major art movement of the 20th century. In fact, many of his fantastic images surpass those of modern surrealists. He is apparently a super surrealist Bosch. Now let me reflect on, that, on this for the next five minutes. One of the interesting things that critics say about or imply about Bosch is that Bosch is very modern, which is apparently why they, ha they feel that he's appropriate for this time and also link him with surrealism. I have always suspected that Bosch lived in a jittery time, something like ours. In an essay entitled, the very telling title, A 15th Century Surrealist, Bosch gives the weight of the past authority to the impatient stirrings of the present and, of course, the war is already in the air. Um, Kurt Seligman, who is at one time a surrealist, <laughs> offers a very formalist analysis of one of Bosch's paintings when he sort of discusses it as if it were an abstract painting, in fact, in the Tiger's Eye during the war. And Clement Greenberg, godfather of modern formalism, says that wrote that Bosch's plastic memes show modernity out of all relation to painting around him. So Bush is apparently in his paintings feel very modern. And I would like to link that directly to the war and the feelings that the war um, brought about. Bush's vision was freshly modern, both stylistically and in terms of its awareness of the anxieties common to the human condition. The almost incidental surrealist characteristics of Bush, the smoke and fire of devastating hell, the violent death, the nightmare to end all nightmares, which is a clear uh, reference, make him so interesting to our troubled world. I don't have the time now, but in parallel to these uh, sort of art critics' comments, you also see in psychoanalytical literature all these studies coming up that psychoanalyze Bosch by means of his paintings. So he's also very, yeah, hot topic in psychoanalysis. Audiences, and in particular the American audiences, I would say, clearly consider Bosch's work sort of weird, strange, scary, funny, irrational, subconscious, and this is all lumped together as fantastical and as surreal as well. So, and it creates this one overarching category of fantastical art. Bosch is modern, Bosch is fantastical, surreal, but now we come to the surrealists, or actually Bourdon, I only have the time to focus on Bourdon here who considers Bosch subversive, heretical, and perhaps even anti-modern. And I would say that Bosch, that Breton adopted Bosch as a precursor during the war, in reaction to Barr and the American audiences, but immediately started positioning him, Bosch, to his own advantage in an ironical, if not a subversive way. Because if we go back to this page from uh, the little booklet of 1942, it's, it's not really about the or it is about the golden age, but in a quite a ironical manner. Um, Louis Bunuel's film was very strongly critical of contemporary French society and politics, so this is a golden age only in an ironical manner. The, work, the body of work from which the citation of Lord Triamon is taken is an intensely ironical body of work, 
And Breton would have been very much aware that the panel he has taken is from the, the Garden of Earthly Delights, which shows the introduction of sin into the world. Uh, and it actually leads to hell on the right panel. So this is not at all a very happy-go-lucky golden age kind of panel. And then in 1947, I would actually argue that Breton was spurred on to include Bosch here by two publications that had just come out. And one of them had sh was showing Bosch to have been a secret alchemist, all these secret alchemical signs in his work. And the other one was arguing that Bosch was a secret Adamite, which is a, a heresy. And we know that Breton read his works because he referred to them quite often in later works again. So I would in fact argue that Breton, being aware of these books, um, considered Bosch to be a secret heretic or a secret alchemist or perhaps both, and as both quite subversive. And it comes together with the fact that in 1947 and almost Breton was very much deeply involved with esotericism and alchemy in particular, so it fits his interest of the time. The fact that even somebody like Jacques Lacan was also psychoanalyzing Bosch and his works sort of brings it back together again for the surrealists. Whereby finally in 57 Bosch is sort of the preeminent artist, magician, <coughs> the visionary who affects change into the world by means of their art. Um, and this art magic, if you read the text, it becomes clear that the art magic is present in Bosch's works, but because of the psychoanalytical references, um, I think perhaps the art magic is also present in Bosch's persona, or at least so it is conceived by André Breton. Bringing me to some preliminary conclusions here, I would say that Bosch was first positioned as a preeminent surrealist by Barr and only subsequently by Ernst and Breton and others. So the sort of natural connection that apparently exists or appears to exist between Bosch and Surrealism was clearer first to critics like Barr and only later Breton and others. Based upon such things as style and subject and iconography and the misunderstanding, I must say, of his iconography, Bosch was considered modern and also fantastical and therefore Surrealism is also considered modern and or fantastical and it's, it's not always clear how these categories work, so very often they overlap but sometimes they are juxtaposed as well. At the same time it's sort of this fantastical art that has been around since the dawn of ages and Bosch is one of the great ones and then you have the Surrealists. It's apparently rooted in the irrational or the subconscious and I think there's a connection here also with the Jung's idea of the collective unconsciousness, which was also sort of gathering momentum by now. And I think it also sort of testifies to the success of the surrealist genealogies. Because in the 40s and 50s, everybody was buying it, and everybody was buying it apparently so much so that Bosch being the, the or surrealist was almost quite natural. But even though the surrealists are sort of positioned as trendsetters, in the interest in Bosch, I would actually say that they were trend followers. Bosch studies was on a rise before the Surrealists latched onto it. The incorporation of Bosch, who is, who is most, he's many things, but he's most of all a painter, I think is also motivated by the fact that American audience, but also European audiences, were considering Surrealism more and more a painter's movement, and Breton needed an inspiring painter figure as an important precursor, but still he positioned him as subversive, heretic, radical, at least pre-modern, and perhaps even anti-modern, because his very medievality makes him anti-modern, and also his apparent visual language of secret symbols and alchemical symbols and hereticism also makes him anti-modern. So there's sort of this subversion of the American view going on here. Finally, Finally, for now, I could go on for another 20 minutes, but that wouldn't be fair to Ivan. Finally, um, while it is discarded by most professionals, there's an essence in there, um, the concept of Bosch as the preeminent surrealist avant la lettre, even the super surrealist, is so deeply anchored in our Western popular consciousness that it's, it's just everywhere, and not only on the internet, but also in newspapers. Um, 
art courses, any popular publications that you can think of. I'm going to leave it here. Thank you.